Well, thank you very much for inviting me this morning for this uh, brief talk on what we started to look at is, which is how much exposure is the child getting? And in this case, it's a preliminary examination of a hypersensitive, electrically, electronically or electromagnetically hypersensitive child. And there are many sources of microwave radiation, so we'll just concentrate on the Wi-Fi in schools, which is also in our homes, in our uh, places, of like coffee shops and so on. Uh, Dr. William Ray said that sensitivity to electromagnetic radiation is the emerging health problem of the 21st century. It is imperative that health practitioners, government schools, and parents learn more about it. And he studies electromagnetically hypersensitive children and people. Uh, it's estimated that in California that's about 3% of our population. So that would be 140,000 kids in our schools and over a million Californians. And these numbers are conservative, I believe. They're, they go up. So we started to use a German dosimeter that can measure many, many frequencies simultaneously. You wear it on your uh, arm, as you can see in the picture here. It's very lightweight, easy to do. You just turn it on and you can record every half second for 24 hours what different frequencies you're being exposed to. And the good thing about this dosimeter, it's the only one I know in the world, it actually measures the field right around your whole body, as you can see in this graphic. The radiation that you're exposed to comes into your body from the side uh, where the radiation source is uh, located, but it travels around your body. Some of it is absorbed, some of it wraps around your body, some of it is reflected. So you need to do the proper modeling to do that. And here's a graph showing the various frequencies. We're concerned in the far right, you can see 2.45 gigahertz, that's where the Wi-Fi operates. And we studied this in a school where there was also a five gigahertz signal. So there's a 2.4 like your microwave oven operates and then the Wi-Fi and many, many other devices. We have this problem um, um, not only in schools but in our homes as you've just heard. And remember, none of these things were ever tested for health effects. They were basically unleashed onto the public thinking because they don't heat up tissue, there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, you also have to understand, this is a, a picture showing that Wi-Fi has been evolving. The first Wi-Fi came out in 1997, that was the first generation. We're up to the fifth generation now, which uses totally different modulation technologies. It uses multiple antennas, it does beam forming, sending signals where you want. It has to put more and more data through the system because everybody wants to download a video in six minutes or something like that. So uh, we have no continuous health monitoring of these newer forms of Wi-Fi, and we're into what's called uh, 802.11 AC now, which is fifth generation, just released in 2012. So we carried out some preliminary measurements in the school on the East Coast in February and March on five different days on a child that was very sensitive, because we wanted to know was there a correlation between his frequent headaches and one's uh, inability to even stay in school because of these symptoms and the exposure. This was a 12-year-old child. Now you have to understand that most of these digital technologies by nature are pulsing. And so they have very many peak pulses, but what they often do is to give you averages, averaging over it, because averaging is important when you have heat exposure, how long are you essentially radiating a, an area. But the peak pulses are much, much more intense, and that's what we're monitoring here. So this is data from an exposure in March of this child, and the green dotted line, I don't know, it's easy to see here, but that's what we use as the safety exposure guideline, which is called the Bioinitiative indoor exposure safety guidelines of about 100 microwatts per square meter. And you can see in different classes, in different rooms, there was higher exposure, and we averaged that over just to see what those peaks are over uh, 10 minutes and so on. So you can just kind of see these red bars. And here's another example, and this was a very short exposure because the child got very sick and had to leave the school that day. Now, these numbers just show the variability of the Wi-Fi signal that the children are being exposed to, and they're very high. Uh, what I did then is something that nobody's really doing, is look at the cumulative exposure over time, and you can see that on the top, little graphs here, it'll be easier to see on the videos, I'm sure, later. 
but the degree of slope of the accumulation of this wireless signal over time will be, perhaps be a much better measure over time. And we can compare this cumulative exposure to um, what we would recommend the child should not be exposed to over a certain time period. So then we can compare, and these graphs basically just show bars, and it tells you how many minutes is the child overall during a school day exceeding the safety guideline. And that's uh, 24 minutes, 30 minutes, but on the difficult days, 46 and 42 minutes. So as part of an eight-hour school day or a six-hour school day, that's a significant amount, and many times the child comes home with headaches under these conditions. Now, to make some sense out of this, you really have to compare this also to levels we're all exposed to. So I measured in coffee shops at low intensity at the top graph there, and you can see that depending on where you sit in the coffee shop, how close you are to the router or the, the hot spot, there may be not so much exposure. And at the bottom, when you sit very close to where the actual router is in the coffee shop, you might get a much higher exposure. But now compare that to the school readings at the top and at the bottom you see coffee shop at low levels and there you can see that curve on the right, the cumulative exposure, and these are just over a seven minute period comparing the same and you can see it's much, much more over in the school. And even if you compare it to a high intensity output in a coffee shop sitting near the router, you can still see that school was in this particular case even higher. And so that becomes worrisome because we have magnetite crystals in our brain coverings called the meninges and it's also in the brain tissue and this directly absorbs Wi-Fi. So we have these little crystals of uh, magnetite. It's a form of iron that absorbs that. And when you think about that we nowadays produce baby monitors which essentially also work at 2.4 gigahertz, the same as Wi-Fi, and they work at the deck cordless telephone frequency of 1.9 gigahertz. And we stick these right next to the little babies. It becomes a little worrisome. These are the top-selling baby monitors from Amazon. All of them use wireless radiation that you're exposing your child to. So the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2013 wrote a letter to the FCC and said, I think we should change the standards. We urge a re-examination of the wireless exposure standards. Canadian doctors are concerned about that. In the Canadian Medical Association Journal, you see uh, write-ups about the federal Wi-Fi panel being criticized because of undisclosed conflicts of interest and being a disaster for public health. And even the California Medical Association seeks new standard for microwaves. You may not be aware that in 2014, in December 7th, the California Medical Association seeks a new wireless standard, and specifically the wording is, whereas peer-reviewed research has demonstrated adverse biological effects of wireless EMFs, including single and double-strand DNA breaks, creation of reactive oxygen species. These are essentially free radicals. It's like rusting uh, prematurely. That's uh, reactive oxygen species, immune dysfunction, cognitive processing effects, stress protein synthesis in the brain, altered brain development, sleep and memory disturbances, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, abnormal behavior, sperm dysfunction, and brain tumors. And this is from the California Medical Association asking for a new examination of our exposure standards. So since 2006, some schools in the UK have tried to uh, wor uh, have worried about health effects and tried to dismantle the wireless networks. And we really need to apply the precautionary principle here, which is essentially, if we don't have all the answers, let's at least start studying this. And my conclusions to, to this would be, we really need dosimetry studies, the kinds I've showed you here, in order to find out how much radiation are we being exposed to so that our children are safe to use wired systems whenever possible, fiber optic or ethernet cables, and you know, really start looking at these peak exposure levels rather than averaging everything down and telling you it's safe. I do believe that it really isn't. And the electromagnetically hypersensitive children and adults are the canary in the coal mines that basically say, we have a problem here, it's time to address it. Thank you very much.